Hi, Bloob. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. I've been looking forward to this for some time. Glad we managed to make yeah. the time that works. Yeah, me too. I'm not sick or away, finally. Mm -hmm. And you are uh, doing both the face and voice and name reveal on this episode. Yeah, it's a it's a big day for me, I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it's lovely to see you and uh, to share who you are with the world. And I think that's really what this show is about, uh, is seeing people. And I think... Um, you know, there's so many, so many beautiful, incredible people in the world. And I want to let this kind of a conversation be a venue to see who people are and share that. And um, yeah, that's, that's a big part of why I start with the question, what's your life story, which I know, I know can be intimidating in your position. It's like, oh man, big, big question. But of course you get to answer that however you want. And I really feel like that question sets a lot of context for who someone is and where they're coming from and of course what happened in their life sort of factually but also you know it gives you a sense of how someone thinks about themselves and their life and what the world is and um, that that sort of framing both the the facts that are surfaced in that answer but also the way that someone answers it really informs me and and the conversation that follows and um, I really appreciate people taking the time to answer it even though it's such a big question so um yeah, with that sort of preface, I'd love to hear if you'd like to share anything about your life story and where you're coming from and what what you know what's been happening so far in this life. And uh you can answer that any way you like. Sure. Yeah, I'll try to go chronologically, although I may end up jumping around a little bit. Um, sure. But yeah, so I was born in and raised in central Wisconsin. Um I have two older sisters. There's a bit of an age gap. Uh, so my family dynamic, I would say, is definitely a big part of who I am today. Um, they're 12 and 13 years older than me, and they're both my half-sisters, and they're stepsisters to each other. So my parents each had one of them and then later got married and had me. Um, but yeah, I'm still really close to both of them. I'd say it's a an interesting sibling dynamic just because we weren't like really close enough in age in the same house growing up to fight over anything since I was like, you know, five when they were like 17 and 18. Um, so yeah, they, I don't know. I really enjoyed my childhood with them and with my parents, spent a lot of time outside. Uh, the road I grew up on was semi-rural. Um, yeah, so we spent a lot of time, there were a lot of trails by our house. So I spent a lot of time on them. Uh, both my parents were like really involved, which was super great. Um, yeah, faith was a big part of our family structure. Uh, grew, grew up evangelical Christian. So it was church every Sunday. I went to a private Christian school through eighth grade, um, <clears throat> which I actually, I loved. <laughs> Like, I loved church growing up. I was such a church girl, uh, <laughs> embraced every aspect of it, um, like, made my best friends there. Uh, my parents' friend group was all through there, so there were just a lot of good social connections um, and activities, and for the most part, I would say a positive and uplifting message, so can't go wrong with that. Um yeah, so that was a big part of my childhood, and so was school, I would say. I really enjoyed school uh, in the summers when people would ask me if I was excited to go back to school. My answer would always be yes, which I learned later was, like, unusual for children, um, and I couldn't understand why, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, through eighth grade, I mean, nothing really big happens, I guess. I started swimming in seventh grade, swimming competitively, and that became a really big part of my life for a few years. Um, I still love it. I just don't do it at meets, obviously. Um, so then, because I started swimming, actually, this was part of the reason I decided to go to a public high school was so that I could do athletics there. Um, so my freshman year, decided to go to a public high school 
which was kind of also my first transition into like a non-religious social scene for the first time. Um, and it was, I think it was really good for me. Um, I still like made a lot of friends. I had swimming and that's in the fall. So like I got to meet a lot of people before school starts. So it didn't feel so intimidating to be the new kid. Um, yeah, and then that winter, I went skiing, downhill skiing, as folks do in Wisconsin, and I wiped out on some ice, and I tore my knee up pretty bad, uh, so I tore my ACL, my MCL, and my meniscus, mm. um, so I needed to have surgery, and I couldn't walk for, like, I say a few months now, because, like, looking back, it seems like it was forever. Maybe it was only, like, a month. Um, but yeah, I was just like in a full leg brace and not able to bend it or put any weight on it. So it's just, it was a huge recovery, like process of like six months of physical therapy. Uh, I had just qualified for a state in swimming and wasn't able to go because I was injured, which was like the most soul crushing thing for me at the time. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so that was, I think, probably, like, my first big, like, tribulation in life, um, and I didn't, I don't think I was emotionally equipped to, like, handle that, or, like, I didn't know how to express my emotions around that. I didn't even know how to, like, feel or name them either at the time, um, and again, like, looking back, I think I was, like, very, very angry, and I just, I didn't know that, and I didn't know how to yeah, go through that in like a healthy way. Uh, so I just did a lot of rep <laughs> repressing it as I'm still prone to do sometimes. Um, yeah, but so then like school kind of remained a good anchor for me um, and I could like pour myself into academics. And eventually, you know, I did like train my way back into swimming and like competing at a state level. Um, it was always kind of a hindrance though um and it'll come up a few times throughout the story <laughs> um and of me like listen learning how to listen to my body too but it yeah it remained a, a thorn in my side for like several years after that um yeah so I I still loved school in high school <laughs> um I was always a straight A student um yeah I guess like fast forward then to figuring out where to go to college. I ended up just hopping over to Minnesota uh, to the state school there. And originally it was gonna study chemistry uh, because I loved it in high school. I always loved science, you know, spending a lot of time outdoors, probably less so in like middle school and high school just because I had so many activities going on, but it was still an important part of my life to like be outside and do active things in the, in the outdoors. Um, yeah, so then I got thrown into this big school and being a straight A student, I know like people say you never really learn to study, which is super true because up until this point, I was just like memorizing things and like regurgitating it back somehow. Um, and then I, I got to college and was like in all these honors classes and like totally just bombed like everything. Um, except my Spanish classes, which I kept just because I really enjoyed learning another language and about another culture. Um, so I was fine at that, but like anything math or science related was just such a struggle for me. And like, I didn't know how to study. So it would just be me like reading things over and over and getting frustrated that I couldn't like regurgitate it then when you have a test. Um, so yeah, that, that was frustrating. It took me like a few years to, to learn how to navigate that. I actually joined a sorority too my first year, which people are like surprised to hear from me um I mean first of all it's Minnesota so it's probably not like the you know view of sororities that you get from like seeing things about like deep south sororities but yeah my um my like thought process behind that was I wanted to force myself into a social scene <laughs> immediately because I'm definitely more of like just fine chilling by myself but like sometimes to my detriment so I knew it would be probably good for me to like make friends right away and have something that like forces me to attend events and meet people so 
And honestly, it didn't really get in the way of my studies much because I didn't make it a priority. But fast forward to junior year, I went to Spain for a semester and just did all Spanish classes. And by this time, I was already having second thoughts about my chemistry major. So um, I already had a minor in chemistry at this point, just with all the coursework I had done. And then had a great time in Spain, ended up looking into possibly joining the Peace Corps. Um, and I guess it's important to point out that I also joined a club on campus called Navigators, which is again, a Christian organization. And all of my summers throughout college, I spent at a Bible camp in Northern Wisconsin. Um, first, I was a lifeguard. I had also like spent every summer there for a week as a camper, but um, I worked as a lifeguard and then also as a camp counselor. And then I was a staff counselor too, one summer. So uh, still remaining a big part of my life up until this point. Um, Yeah, so I'm um, in Spain, I'm looking into the Peace Corps, found out that my mom actually also had looked into the Peace Corps at one point in her life, which I didn't know about. So that was kind of cool. Um, but then she ended up getting pregnant and having my sister and was never able to go. So um, and I guess another important thing, this is me jumping around, but my my parents both grew up um, pretty poor and were never able to travel much or really had much. They both had a lot of siblings. Um, and I think with me, like after my sisters left the house at like, you know, when I was six, it was almost like growing up as an only child. So I had to keep myself entertained, but I also like got to develop a pretty close relationship with my parents. Um, and they definitely prioritized travel quite a bit and thought that was like an important part um, like for us to do together as a family and also just for me as a kid getting to travel and experience different parts of the US and even different countries. Um, a lot of those were short-term mission trips, which um, yeah, looking back now, I definitely view as a bit problematic, <laughs> but uh, I would say we're good for me at the time. Um, yeah, so I applied to the Peace Corps. Now we're back to my junior year of college. I applied to the Peace Corps just kind of on a on a whim. Um, I didn't really put that much, like I wanted to do it, but I did not expect to get in. The program I applied to was pretty competitive. Um, so you can decide to either like do a general application and then they can sort you and put you where they think you fit best. Or you can apply to a specific program um, in a specific country and see if you get it. Um, so I did that with a Spanish literacy advocate position in the Dominican Republic. Um, so people always get confused at that as well because they're like, don't they already speak Spanish there? Um, the answer is yes, that's their first language. Um, but their literacy rate is pretty low. Um, so the Peace Corps works with them in their native language, which is part of what drew me to the program. Um, yeah, to mostly elementary schools just to help with reading and writing. So I found out that summer that I got into the program, which was leaving in March of the following year. Um, and since I was a junior, technically, I had the full year left. So I had to figure out how to graduate early. Um, and like, I already knew it was possible if I dropped my chemistry major and just finished college with my Spanish major, then I would like be done with all my requirements in December. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, and also at this time, when I applied to the Peace Corps, um, I was kind of at a crossroads, I guess, because the other program that I was considering applying to was to be an international missionary with that club on campus. Um, 
So when I was like debating between those two options, something that stuck out to me. So the position with the club I was in um, was to specifically, you were sent to whichever country, the Dominican Republic was actually also a country there, interestingly enough. Um, but you were like based at a college campus there as well. And you were like going to <laughs> um, like forum relationships with college age students and kind of like disciple and mentor them. And then obviously, you know, um, talk about Jesus. So something that stuck out to me about the difference between those two programs was like administering to like physical needs versus um, like just spiritual needs. And like, I realized something then, which was that I was really frustrated with the way religion sometimes failed to recognize the physical needs of people. And so I wanted to pivot and focus on that. Um, and at the time it like, wasn't a choice like between the two by any means, because like, I was still very committed to practicing Christianity. Um, but I, I'm now looking back at very much as like a crossroads that definitely sent me in one direction. So yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Um, yeah, so then graduated college, went to the Peace Corps. Um, and like the Peace Corps was one of like the best things that has ever happened to me, probably. <laughs> um, I met a group of like really great friends um, that I just connected with like right away. Um, you do training together for the first three months of like a two year service. So uh, you get to spend like a lot of one on one time with your cohort. Um, and there's about there was about 40 total. And then that was like two different groups. So each group had about 20 people, the education group that I was in being one of those. So yeah, then I spent the next, so this was 2019 uh, that I went to the Peace Corps, uh, spent the first three months near the Capitol getting training, uh, getting more Spanish classes, even though by this point I was pretty like, good at speaking Spanish um but yeah the accent there is very difficult to master um and just like the colloquialisms are wild so it was a great time but um yeah and then I got sent to literally the middle of nowhere um you don't like get to pick where you go obviously they kind of match you with a community um so yeah, I got sent like to the middle of the desert, which is like not what people think of when they think of the Dominican Republic either. They think of like the beaches and Punta Cana and kind of like more tropical. Um, but towards the border with Haiti, it also is a desert. So that's where I was. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, so this was the like first time I started kind of questioning my faith. Um, I because I was living in a country that their main religion, actually fun fact, they're the only country that has a Bible on their flag. Um, so like they do very much like tout the fact that they are a Christian nation. Um, a lot of them practice Catholicism. Um, but like upon attending churches there, it like became very clear that it was a different religion than what I had been practicing and like what I had grown up in and this was mind-blowing to me because I was like wait it has the same name and we're reading the same book so like how are they this vastly like different from each other and that set off a lot of questions for me um yeah because it like made me think for the first time like huh like why can two different people in two different cultural contexts like look at the same thing and come to totally different conclusions and like what makes them right or wrong. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of in the background the whole time I was 
also trying to like fit in and like meet people in my community and also like do a good job at being a teacher in the elementary school. Um, yeah, so it was a it was a process. It was also like my first time really living alone because uh, in college, you know, you have apartments with your friends and whatnot. Um, and, yeah, and yeah, I had to like face a lot of fears uh, pretty literally. Um, I hate spiders, for example, and like the DR is home to so many tarantulas. It's insane. And they just come right up in your house and you have to get them outside of your house, uh, which was not my favorite thing to do. Uh, yeah, so it's also when I adopted Poncho. Um, and so I had a dog in my house that was also partially due to like keep um like I don't know keep unwanted guests away um also just for a sense of safety for me as like a young woman in a foreign country in my own house and like not super sure of myself um yeah had some interesting situations there but I could talk about like any of this for way too long but yeah um then what so then it's March of 2020 and I had been in the DR almost exactly a year a little over like within a week I think over um had just celebrated my birthday away from home for the first time I think um and we got this email about this thing called COVID that was happening that nobody really knew anything about um, and like kind of started this mass unrest with like all of our group chats and whatnot. Um, and all of us were like, oh, like it's gonna be fine. Like we're safer here cause it's not as populated and you know, like who's gonna, <laughs> who's gonna come to the middle of the desert in the DR? Like how is that illness gonna get here? Um, and I think like the first email we got like from Peace Corps staff themselves were, it was like, yeah, like stay calm. Like we're not really making any decisions yet, but we'll keep you updated on the situation. And then it was literally like two days, like within that same weekend, we might've gotten the email on a Friday night and this was like Sunday afternoon. Um, we got another email saying, we're evacuating you. You all need to be in the Capitol within 24 hours. Um, so it was like total whiplash of like you had just, they always say like the first year in the Peace Corps, you should really just be like making relationships and like getting to know people in your community, making connections. Um, and then like the second year is kind of when like you get all your projects underway. And like, so I had been like planning all these things that I wanted to do both like camps over the summer and then like preparing for the next school year. I had to do like all my testing still at the end of the year uh, to kind of like evaluate how I did that first year. Um, and it all just kind of got like cut off super, super suddenly. And I also had to like pack up my entire like house um, and like figure out what I could take back with me in a suitcase. And then also say like, try to find everyone and say goodbye um, to like everyone in person and like also explain to them like why I'm leaving because like that was really hard to just be like hey I know this like scary situation is happening and I've like made myself part of your community um, for the last year oh I think I would get emotional about this yeah but like the decision being like totally out of my hands um, cause I think most of us, like we really wanted to stay and they had said in the first email, they were like, Hey, if anyone is like concerned and like wants to go home, we understand why you would make your decision. And like, I didn't hear of anyone at least that weekend who like had said, Hey, I want to pack up and go home. So yeah, so we all had to make our, you know, our way back to the Capitol, um, and then it was, it was just really tense and like scary. 
I'm sure everyone can remember back to like not that feeling of just like not knowing what to expect or what's happening and just being scared and like no good place to find like valid information from. Um, but yeah, we got back to the Capitol um, and then they were like, so this was Monday now. And then they had staggered all of our flights for Tuesday and Wednesday because the airports were shutting down on Thursday. So it's just a really quick turnaround. Um, <sighs> yeah, so, and then I had a dog, which just like complicated the situation. I got him home easily compared to volunteers in other countries, which was really awesome and a huge blessing because that would have probably emotionally destroyed me even more. <laughs> um, but yeah, I got him home like within 24 hours after I was home. So that was really good. Um, but yeah, so then we kind of just were home all of a sudden with like nothing to do and also just like a mass public panic in the U.S. at the time as well. Um, so I decided to, I chilled at home for like a month or two. Um, but that Bible camp that I worked at during the summers was they decided to still do camps with like some, you know, different procedures and arrangements. So I decided to go not as a counselor or anything, but just as a barista, which I had done also previously, which I'm doing now, if anyone didn't know that. Um, and so that was like another interesting spiritual like checkpoint I guess for me because this was a place that was like literally a safe place and like this idyllic um like community for me growing up and then to go back into that after this experience I just had uh in the DR and also amidst COVID-19 uh with some like interesting politics surrounding that whole sphere was hard for me to come to terms with that like maybe like you know I was a different person at this point and like this community wasn't the best fit for me anymore um and I still definitely like had friends that were very much in that community that I could like talk about these things with and still like be myself and express myself um, so that was reassuring. Um, yeah, so then I decided, I have, like, a lot of, like, career, uh, swivels in this story, so I moved to Madison. My friend was teaching there, and then I had another friend, like, my best friend from high school, who decided that she could do nursing there. So we all moved in together. Um, and what the Peace Corps had shown me about like myself maybe and how I like to work is that it felt a lot of the time like I was trying to patch um, a Band-Aid onto a bullet hole a little bit with their like education and teaching system. And I was frustrated that I couldn't work at a higher level to address issues like upstream before they like were downstream. Um, so like less on the cleanup end and more on the like where where the problem is happening. Um, and so then I thought maybe like I could go to law school and become a lawyer um, because then at least I'd be like working on issues at the start in my mind. Um, so I got my paralegal certificate that summer during COVID online and started to work at a law firm, but it was like a bankruptcy law firm, which is the last thing I recommend to anyone who's trying to get into law is to try, try your hand at bankruptcy. Uh, super not fun, super dry. <laughs> I also did work for a family lawyer. That was a little more interesting. Um, it's like, I mean, I hate to say interesting, but it was <laughs> so but like divorce cases and child support cases um 
and then they did do like litigation. Um, so th I guess there were some interesting aspects of it, but I hated being in an office. Like I would say nine to five, but realistically, like as a paralegal, you do a lot of overtime. So it was not nine to five. I did not have a work-life balance. COVID was still happening with all of this. I actually was able to go into the office. Um, it was a smaller law firm. So <clears throat> I enjoyed that. I'm glad I didn't have to work from home, but yeah, I was, <laughs> I was just a little disillusioned at what the law office uh, environment was like. And yeah, started questioning whether the <laughs> law would be a good fit for me. Um, they were just a little intense, <laughs> uh, not how I would like to treat my coworkers. And this definitely could have just been the specific law firm I was at, but, um, yeah. So then again, I was at this point where I was like, I don't know what to do with my life pretty much. Um, Actually, that might be the first time I was at that point. It feels like I'm at that point all the time now, so I'm just getting comfortable. But um, <clears throat> before this, I thought I had my life like totally figured out and I laugh at that person now, which is all in good fun. But um, yeah, so I called my friend from the Peace Corps just to like catch up with her. We hadn't talked in a while. Um, I realize now I probably like didn't process any of the evacuation. And I kind of just like lost touch with a lot of those really good friends because I'm we were all just trying to deal with what was happening to us. Um, but I called her and I was like, yo, I hate my job. I don't know what to do with my life. How are you? Um, and she was like, hey, like, I'm okay. She like went and traveled on unemployment money for like the whole summer and was like car camping and stuff. And I was just like super jealous of her the whole time. Um, but like in an inspirational way. <laughs> um, and then she was like, she was also like, she's just like the crazy, I don't know, she, she should be on this podcast. She has some amazing stories, but um, yeah, she was like, she's like, yeah, so I decided I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail. Like you should just come with me. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and it was funny because uh, at the start of 2020, I made decade goals for myself. Um, and one of the things I had written was to do a complete through hike of the AT and the PCT. And she didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> and I don't even think I thought of that at the time either, but I found the list actually like this in the past few months, which shows you that I haven't unpacked from the Peace Corps still. And it's like three years <laughs> later. So um but yeah, and then I saw that and I was like, wow, like that's crazy that I wrote that down as something I wanted to do. Um, but it makes sense why I think I was like primed already to say yes. Um, I'm really proud of myself that I did say yes, because it isn't something I would have expected of myself at the time. Um, but I was like, huh, like I told her, I was like, you know, like I'll think about it actually and get back to you. So I didn't rule it out right away by any means. Um, and then I like actually did start thinking about it. And I was like, I really want to do this. Like quitting my job isn't really costing me anything. I don't think it's what I want to pursue. Uh, so like, what are the drawbacks here? And I ended up calling my parents who are like so, so supportive of me. I'm so thankful <laughs> for them. Um, and like, they were like, yeah, like, that's cool. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like total, I was totally expecting them to be like, no, like you need to like find a job. You need to like figure out your life. Like, what are you doing? Um, probably cause that's how I was feeling in my head. Um, but they were like, no, like, that's really cool. Like that's an awesome opportunity. Like it made them more comfortable that I had a friend to do it with. My mom's main concern as always was like, how safe is it? Like, are you going to get murdered? Are you going to get like killed by a storm, you know, the classic mom worries. Um, yeah, so that like caught me off guard. Um, and so I just decided, I was like, you know, I wanna be a person 
who like says yes to something like this. And so then I did. <laughs> and so I quit my job. Um, and this was in February of 2021. And we were planning on starting the trail in late March. So it was like a month and a half of preparation. Um, and thankfully, like my friend already had a ton of stuff planned and like I already had some camping stuff. So it wasn't like a huge I had done a backpacking trip before. Uh, she had never backpacked in her life and just decided to do this, which I love her for. But um. Yeah, so we prepared and met in the Georgia, the Atlanta airport for the first time since we had been evacuated from the Peace Corps together. Um, she lives in Pennsylvania, so it's not like we were in visiting distance, especially during COVID. But yeah, and so then we got there. It was March 30th we got there, and we wanted to start March 31st, and it was like this massive storm. Um, so like very first day, our plans were like out the window, uh, which is just kind of like the whole the whole trail experience, which I learned I wasn't prepared for it, but I like learned. Um, and like I'm very stubborn and like I like to have a plan. So it was a really hard to like get there and not be able to like start the day we wanted to. Um, and like also just like paying a lot of money to stay in this dumb hostel that was like overpriced because it's the only one there at the start of the trail and like all this stuff but we waited it out and and you know you just had like pre-trail jitters like you just wanted to start you're excited it's the beginning um, and both of us went into it with the attitude of like we weren't super hardcore about like we need to finish this it was just like let's hike and like, let's see how far we get. And if we can't like go any further, then we'll stop. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah. And like, there were things too that we like didn't know how it would work until we got there and did it. Um, like, and we have both read and like listened to a lot of podcasts about the trail um, and like hiking with someone. And like a lot of people are like, yeah, you're just like going to get sick of them. Like you're going to get in fights. Like one of your paces is probably going to be different than the other person. So like it might be annoying. Someone's either always waiting or the other person's catching up. Um, and like we didn't have any of those issues, which was so cool. Like she is like way shorter than me. So um, she's kind of tiny, but she's like so speedy. And yeah, I guess like it just, we never argued about anything. Like we were just like honest with each other about what we wanted. And if the other person didn't care, they were like, yeah, okay, let's do that. So it was super easy. Um, yeah, we met amazing people. <laughs> Some of them we hiked with for like, so they call them uh, tramlines or tra trail families. Um, a lot of times, like, people will, will form these big groups and, like, hike together and stick together. Um, and also, like, through hikes can be known for, like, kind of being a party scene. Like, when you get into hostels, into towns, um, yeah, I mean, like, people are going to drink and have fun because you're <laughs> literally putting your body through hell the other 24 hours of every other day. Um but we had talked about that beforehand and both of us were like, yeah, that's not what we're really doing this for. Um, it wasn't the social aspect. It was kind of just to like reground ourselves. Um, Cause like we were both in this spot of like not knowing what we were doing. So we, we did like hike with people on and off for a month or two. Um, and I mean, we did like party when we went into towns occasionally it definitely was not a focus or like priority of ours but yeah so um over the next six months I hiked over 2,200 miles from Georgia to Maine um and I chronicled a lot of it on Twitter with like pictures and updates and I tweeted a lot <laughs> and I was surprised by this and other people were also surprised by this but I had service like everywhere. I had a battery pack. I mean, you're stopping every few days in towns to like charge up and get food. Um, and there's not much else to do, <laughs> to be honest, you're walking. So 
Um, yeah, I, it was, it was great. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, towards the end, it got really hard, just like physically. Um, we, in the end of July, beginning of August, maybe, stopped for 10 days at her house in Pennsylvania. And that break was a little bit too long. And we both like admitted this afterwards, but it was really hard to like motivate ourselves to get back into it after resting and like eating any food we wanted for those 10 days. Um, yeah, but we did. And then like, I think our muscles honestly just started deteriorating. Like we started falling a lot. Um, I also posted those updates to <laughs> Twitter. Um, and like, the last month I'd say like her legs would start shaking like at night and like cramping um it was yeah so it was just a lot to get through um and it culminated with our summit of Katahdin in Baxter State Park uh which was like the dumbest decision possibly we made on trail for the whole six months was to summit the day we did but <laughs> both of us are stubborn I guess and we just wanted to be done and my parents had actually so once again of like my parents being <laughs> cool humans um they had like literally chronicled this whole journey for me and like during I'd they were so involved like my dad would text me weather updates <laughs> on like an almost daily basis which was like way too much and like I know he wanted to be helpful, but it really doesn't matter because, like, I'm going to be hiking regardless of what the weather is. But thank you for <laughs> informing me, I guess. Um, but, yeah, he, like, they just had it all mapped out. They were the ones who were, like, sending my food drops to the towns that I was going to be in. Um, I had planned a bunch of that beforehand and, like, packed it up. Um, but, yeah, so they decided to drive out uh, with my dog, who I left behind for those six months, which was also really hard. Um, but they met us in Maine. And so that was another thing is that like they had been there because we planned on finishing earlier and then we just like slowed down so immensely in those last few weeks because we were so tired. Um, but they had driven out and I had like planned something when I was back to like pet sit actually, I think. And like it, that time was coming up. So we were like, okay, we just got to finish. <laughs> we're this close. Let's just do it. Um, but it was during a hailstorm and yeah, Katahdin is like, it's pretty much like rock, like bare rock climbing for like a lot of the last bit. Um, and it was terrifying. Like <laughs> I wasn't sure if we were gonna make it, uh, like we couldn't see, which actually maybe was a good thing. Cause I'm like slightly scared of heights and we, I couldn't see over the edge of the mountain just cause it was all fog. And it's not like a, like, the Colorado mountains or anything. It's like less than 6,000 feet, but it's still a good ways up um, with some sharp drop-offs. So yeah, it was, we, yeah, we somehow made it um, in the rain and hail and slipperiness of that and cold. It was like freezing, obviously, because there was hail. Um, yeah, so then that was done, and again, as is, like, me, I guess, is I don't think I really processed that journey, and then I immediately just, like, found a job and started working again as a barista, and I, like, told myself that I was choosing to be a barista because it would give me, like, time and space to process, um, but I, like, don't think it did because, so I finished in September, and I got the job like literally a week and a half later, like in October. Um, and then in January, I enrolled in my master's program. Uh, so I'm in my master's of natural resources, which was obviously heavily influenced by my hike of the AT, um, which made me realize, hey, like if I can have a job being outside and like interacting with things I love and like plants and animals all day long <laughs> why wouldn't I do that uh so that's my current trajectory but um yeah so I was a barista in my hometown and then moved up into the peninsula of Wisconsin uh to a more touristy area to manage a coffee shop there 
Um, and I've kind of been hanging out hanging out there ever since. And I'm still breezing. I'm still in school. Um, I'll finish this summer. And I just accepted a seasonal job with the DNR. Um, so that'll start in April. And I'm excited for that. So that's where I'm at. Well, thank you so much for answering, Bloop. It's uh, such a treat to hear people's life. And uh, I feel like you know, I'd glimpsed a lot of this over the time that we've been friends on Twitter, but it's nice to kind of see the whole picture and hear you talk about it. So thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, of course. What does it feel like to have shared all of that right now? It's like a deep sigh. <laughs> like, <ooh. laughs> um, Yeah, I was like, I mean, I was kind of thinking about how I would present my life story uh before this but like nothing I don't think like prepares you like you just get into it you know like it's your life um I don't know so I was it's, it's like surprising like which turns you end up taking and like which things you totally leave out hmm. um yeah but it was fun I don't know hmm. thanks for letting me do that oh my pleasure um yeah there's a few areas I want to ask you about and maybe just to start sort of in media res in the middle of your life. I, you said that the Peace Corps was one of the best things that ever happened to you in your life. And I'm curious, what about it was so good for you? And like, how did you grow during that time, even though it was sort of cut short? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'd say like the spiritual aspect of like me having to like come face to face with I mean, people say this phrase a lot. It's really overused, but like, quote, making your faith your own. Because um, like growing up in a home, like, you know, I just, I'm doing what my parents tell me to a certain extent, you know, like if they go to church, odds are I'm also going to church. Um, and while I did embrace that, like you never, or I never had to live that out in any sort of way. Um, and college was like, yeah, kind of, but you're still so like surrounded by this community that it's really easy to just kind of like ride other people's vibes, if that makes sense. Um, so like, I never like made like, I never had to like decide anything about what I thought really. Um, and then like in the Peace Corps, it, I mean, I spent so much time literally just by myself, like Oh man, I read so many books and like wrote a lot, uh, journaled a lot. Um, and like really just tried to like come to terms. I tried to like um, intellectualize my way through religion for like a good chunk of that um, and like prove it <laughs> to myself, which that was fun. Um, and then like once like that fails because like that's impossible, then I like try to like emotionally justify it and like that also just doesn't work. Um so yeah, you just I mean like I had to sit with uncertainty for the first time ever, and that was really scary and like another fear um that I talked about like having to face fears in that era. Um yeah. I don't know. I had a lot of time with my with my own thoughts. So I think that's why it was um probably the best part of my life. Also like related to meeting the people I did, um having that connection with my friend to then like hike the AT like that. I mean maybe it would have happened in a different way. Um but it's cool that it happened like because of her and our friendship. Um and obviously that was like hugely influential and like now being on the natural resources path that I am. So yeah, I don't know. Um, and again, just like living alone in general, I think it gave me a lot like of confidence in like adulting, <laughs> like, hey, I can like, you know, figure things out. Um, also definitely shaped a lot of my thoughts on just like standard of living um and how privileged most of us are like I was like using a bucket to shower with like cold water for a year and I was like hand washing all my laundry um 
I was getting like water delivered to my door because there's like not a well of clean water that I can like turn on the sink to access. There are certain days of the week that I know I'm not going to have electricity. Um, so like living in that for a year is like coming home then to the U.S. and especially like being thrown back home into the U.S. Um, really puts it in perspective a bit. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful to hear about that. Uh, I can kind of really get a sense of how you changed and why those conditions would be so powerful for you. So, um, yeah, I think I think a lot of this sort of a conversation for me is about, you know, my own life is finite and I have had the experiences that I've had. And so it's like a chance to see through other people's eyes. And, you know, I've never been in the Peace Corps and um, I'm also one of the things I'd really love to ask you a lot about is is your faith and your background with religion and um, you know I have my own history with these topics but it's a very different one and so I'd love to dive into that and you know I was really touched by the way you described in your childhood just loving going to church and uh, how sweet that was for you and so I was, I was wondering if you could sort of paint me a picture of of what it was like to go to church as a kid and what you loved about it. Ooh, that's a fun question. Uh, yeah, I can try. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, so A, like a ton of my friends were there. So it was just this like excuse every week to go and hang out. <laughs> um, I got to go to this thing called Sunday school. Um, when the adults all go and listen to their like serious message we, the children, get to go into this room filled with our peers and like two usually pretty cool teachers and we get snacks <laughs> like goldfish or animal crackers and juice mm. or water. Um, and we get to like listen to these fun stories and like maybe see it acted out or like get like a picture or like puppet show about it. Um, we get to play games with each other. We get to like draw pictures and do crafts. Um, so honestly, like as a child, at least it's kind of like how school was in a way, you know, like you think of like preschool and kindergarten. Um, you're just like learning how to socialize with your friends and like also learning like how to be a decent human at the same time and like learning how to share, like don't lie to people, don't cheat, um, which are like, you know, just classic, classic things that we try to teach as a society. So um, yeah, and then like afterwards or maybe beforehand, you know, you get to like go and like sing songs or like listen to pretty music. Um, so that was nice. I always enjoyed music growing up. Um, yeah, and then you get like donuts maybe, and then you get to go home. So <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> That sounds pretty great. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, they had to ask this question. So so the I I love the picture that you painted and it's it I sort of get the sense of you as like, I don't know, four, five, six, seven, eight, or something like that. And I'm wondering if we could sort of fast forward to when you were twelve or thirteen or fourteen or something like that. And, you know, definitely not uh, you know, maybe before you were in high school and, and shifted to the public school, like what was your sense of what religion was then and what was it like for you then? Yeah, I think there was some tension at that point in like, um, it's like an us versus them thing. Cause like in middle school, like I knew it was quote unquote weird to like go to a private school. Like most kids don't do that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you almost feel like a minority in that way. Um, and so there's this, like, reinforced social dynamic of, like, banding together, like, you against the world. Um, and then at the same time, there was also a tension between, like, again, like, that concept of making your faith your own. So, like... I 
can now like think for myself at this age. Um, I can, you know, problem solve and think critically a little, <laughs> a little bit at least. Um, so like, what are these things that I'm being taught? Like, what do they mean? How can I apply them? Um, like, can I self teach, you know, if like, I have this text, which is the Bible in front of me, and I'm like reading it, like, can I make that mean something to me, instead of like having a pastor, or a teacher tell me, this is what this means. Um, but then at the same time, with like you reading it, there's always this like, fact checking that happens of like I don't it's ah it's this like really weird because first you have the Holy Spirit which is like supposed to be convicting you of like right versus wrong um so like if you're a Christian you're supposed to have this like Holy Spirit to help you and like guide you um but then at the same time like oh, like, you're only a kid, uh, so, like, do you actually know what you're reading, or, like, do you need these, like, devotionals that will, like, kind of, like, have you do your own thing, but then also, like, tell you, like, this is what it's supposed to mean, um, yeah, so it's this, like, very weird balance, because if you read something and say, hey, like, I think this means this, like, there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna get corrected, and then be told, like, oh, like, maybe they'll pick out something that they is, like their truth but then say oh but it's actually this so yeah hmm. Hmm. confusion maybe is how i would sum that up <laughs> that mm -hmm. period of time hmm. Hmm. i'm trying to think what the i i can feel this question but what is it <laughs> to put into words um So you were confused and, and there was, yeah, I, I guess, I guess the question is about evangelical Christianity. And because this is something that I see sort of from the outside being in America, it's like, oh, I know about it and have friends that are evangelical Christians. And like, you know, maybe I've been to some services and things like this, but like, I don't really know what that's like uh, quintessentially. And so I'm wondering if you could like tell me how you would characterize evangelical Christianity. Like the theology of it? Yeah, theologically and then also maybe culturally, maybe both of those. Yeah, so um yeah, theologically um yeah, Jesus is the son of God. Uh, he's fully man and fully human at the same time. And he physically came to earth as a baby. Um, he lived a perfect life without sinning. And then as a sacrifice for us, he was crucified on the cross. Um, but he rose again three days later and ascended into heaven and because he did this, all we have to do as people is believe in him and what he did to be quote unquote saved. Um, and this salvation is what grants you access to heaven. Um, so yeah, I was taught from a very young age that uh, all people are inherently evil um, and that we're born, like, separated from God, and so the only way to bridge that gap is, like, to believe that, like, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, um, and, like, sin is usually defined as anything that goes against <laughs> the will of God, which, like, <laughs> it makes me laugh now. It didn't then, but, um, yeah, it can be an action or an inaction, um, Yeah, uh, I think that's where like a lot of, I'll say more on that later, but um, yeah, so that's like the basis theologically, like they believe in a literal heaven and hell. Uh, so if you die like without uh, 
coming to this belief, then you're going to spend an eternity, like a literal eternity in hell. Um, yeah, so that kind of manifests in a few different ways culturally, I think. Um, yeah, for, for me at least, um, it's like a lot of like, uh, action policing I don't like there's a probably a better phrase for this but like I'm I'm sure that like people have all seen like a Christian reaction of like being really offended at like things that they would consider sin um <clears throat> and like I felt that even like within Christianity just like as a kid you know like at a private school you're gonna have a dress code um, which, like, public schools also have dress codes, but the way they, like, uh, kind of sell that to you, it, it's just, like, very different, um, because it's, like, a modesty issue, <laughs> which is just its own problem, but, um, yeah, so, I don't know, it's, like, I think almost, like, a sense of shame too I think a main difference with like Christianity and other religions too is that like there's well maybe not but there's nothing you can do to earn it it's just like this gift that is freely given to you and all you have to do is accept it um but it's kind of weird too because it's like well I don't like you're taught like I don't deserve this um and that's just a weird like it's a weird thing to wrap your mind around, I think. Hmm. What was confusing to you about this as a teenager? Um, I think like the classics of like, you know, why does God let bad things happen? Like if he's all powerful, all knowing, um, he could just like make a utopia and it would be fine. Um, and like, does it make him cruel to not do that? And that's where this whole like concept of deserving comes in because then you have people answering that with like, well, we don't deserve any of this in the first place. Um, so like just the fact that like, you know, he offers us this chance at redemption is more than enough. And you're like, oh, okay. Like, I guess that makes sense. Um, what else is confusing? Um, Sometimes I, and this more manifested towards like later high school and college even, but I would do things or like engage in activities that would be considered quote unquote sinful and like did not feel any guilt about it uh, from like a very first, like the more you, like I sat and thought about it and would like try to make it fit into my like Christian narrative, like the more I would then feel guilty about it later. Uh, because that's what, like, I'm taught I'm supposed to, like, feel bad about this. Um, um, but, like, coming to realize, like, hey, I'm, like, doing these things. Like, I'm not hurting myself. I'm not hurting another person. But, like, why, like, what makes that bad? And, like, if it is bad, and, again, I have this Holy Spirit who's supposed to convict me of things that I do that are wrong. Like, why do I not feel that way? Uh, so that was also confusing. Hmm. You mentioned that you did um, short-term missions in high school and that you now find those problematic. What what do you, how do you see those now? Yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot of them, and I, I know they can be different depending on who does them, but the way that a lot were organized through my church was we would go and it was usually a lot of kids, at least, you know, I went as a kid, they also do adult ones. Um, but like, as kids, you're just like showing up to kind of um, help on these projects, whether it's like construction or like a VBS, which is vacation Bible school. So it's like this camp that a lot of churches do in the summer. So you'd be partnered with a church that's in this different foreign country. And you'd go and you'd bring them a lot of like supplies or money in some cases to like be able to do these projects. But then you leave after like a week or two. Um, 
So they were always like really, you know, it's like this emotional high as a kid that you're doing this and like you're learning a lot about this other culture and you feel like you're helping them. Um, and in some ways you are short term. And then um, for them, like then you leave and there's like no follow up because <laughs> you're doing this like what, maybe once a year, uh, maybe like more spaced out than that. Um, so you've just like done this project, but there's no, it's not like you're coming alongside someone and like actually forming relationships that you're going to maintain and like, I don't know, be able to like form a partnership with to maintain a project or a program. Um, a lot of times it kind of seems like it's just a money dump. Um, and then you leave and then it kind of like can break down if there's not good like leadership in place there. So. That makes sense. I'm curious about your experience in the Dominican Republic. And um, I, I was I was really struck by the phrase you used. You, used. you said, oh, it's like a different religion. Uh, and like it's uh, that's I would have imagined you putting that differently. And. I'm curious if you can describe the differences that you saw and how you understood that at the time. Yeah, so my, um, there was like one specific like day that it just like struck me. Um, so the word they use to describe like Protestantism in the DR is evangelical. Um, so it's kind of like the whole group of like Christian, but it's not Catholic. Um, and I remember going to some evangelical services there. And um, it just, it was very intense. And to be fair, I haven't experienced a lot of other denominations in like Protestant United States. Uh, so maybe some of them are more like that, but it was like very much like, <laughs> like the pastor like shouting at you like you're a sinner like you need to stop doing this this and this you need to repent you need to like you know like come to Jesus type of thing um which I know it does happen elsewhere but it was very like whoa like this is not how I have like practiced my faith or like would present it to anybody um and then I remember talking to a woman in my community um like religion just came up. I was just like walking around, just trying to talk to people, introducing myself, like telling them why I was there. Um, and if people asked, like, I would say that I was Christian. Um, and like, I would talk about it. Um, and like what that meant to me. <laughs> but I remember her telling me, this was another big difference. It's, and it's more of a, like a cultural difference, but the way that they used religion to justify it struck me um and she was saying that women aren't allowed to wear pants they're not allowed to wear makeup they're not allowed to like get their hair done um and she like quoted scripture at me to justify why they believed this and I was like aghast because like this is I've read this passage like I've read the bible cover to cover multiple times um and like to me, it was like, no, you're using this out of context. Like, that's not what that means. Um, but like, then it made me take a step back and think, well, how is like my like culture of religion using things out of context to justify what they believe? Um, and couldn't anyone really take any passage of the Bible and somehow like it's, I mean, you don't even have to twist it, but just using it in a way that justifies something you've done or something you believe. Um, and then the fact that in America, it's so, it is so intellectualized now, like pastors go to college to get a degree because they've studied this. And so I started like pondering that because, you know, if <laughs> like where where did that like practice come from? Like, how did that start? Because 2000 years ago, 
there was no degree, you know, for becoming a pastor. Like you were just a leader in your community. And like, you know, it was based on character and I mean, still like your societal ranking, but it was just a weird turn for me to take because like if I came to my parents now with something in the Bible and like tried to form an argument on it, they'd be like, well, like, like what's your source like to back that up? Like not the Bible as a source, but like, well, like a pastor would say this or like this textbook would say this about that. And it's like, I don't know, that seems weird to me in like a practice of spirituality of any sort uh, to like kind of, yeah, gatekeep it like that, I guess. That sounds, that sounds so disorienting. Like um, the sense I get from it is that something that was familiar to you was suddenly made foreign. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Hmm. What did you see differently about the religion of your childhood and evangelical Christianity as you'd practiced it through the lens of this really different form of Christianity? Um, I mean, I think I felt betrayed a little bit. Um, I still think that the majority of people in my sphere, at least, are so well-intentioned. Um, and like the, <laughs> yeah, just like the church families and like leaders I had, um, both at like church, at the camp I was, like, I, like, I do genuinely believe like they loved me as a person and they want the best for me. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was, <laughs> It was just a lot to grasp. And then it moved from like a feeling of betrayal to like a feeling of pity almost. Um, because like, it felt like they were like missing so much by like confining themselves to such a narrow view of like how, like how God works. <laughs> um, which is also ironic to me because like another thing that like people, a phrase they would throw around is like, don't put God in a box, you know, like, and it's like, that's exactly what you're doing um, with like your whole structure of like how this religion functions. Um, yeah. So it really just became kind of disillusioned with like the church um, as like an organization Um Yeah, and then just like, it's it's like really hard to have conversations with people about it. And I've only like barely attempted this like with my parents and they don't even understand like the full extent of how my views have changed on it. Um, and that's kind of a point of, <laughs> I go back, on forth, back and forth on this all the time because like I'm trying to manage their emotions so that they don't worry about me <laughs> hmm. because I've seen how they've reacted when other people like quote unquote leave the faith. Um, and I know it would like be heartbreaking for them. Um, and like, I'm not worried about it in that way, but it it is hard because like I am really close with them. So it's like constantly like guarding and keeping a part of myself from them. Um, and like, it is kind of like lying to them, hmm. uh, which is tough, but it's it's so hard to, like talk your way through it with someone I think like they really do just like have to have an experience that kind of shifts their own perspective um yeah which is kind of a bummer but yeah how do you think that Christianity shaped you and what values do you still have that you think came from your childhood and the religion of your youth? Um, yeah, so I think being taught that you're inherently a bad person does some damage. <laughs> um, 
I think like a huge part of me just like strives to be good because of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's like this constant like weighing in my mind of like, there's no like bar. So it's not like, am I good enough? Like there's nothing I'm necessarily reaching towards, but it's just like this sense of like, this aura, I guess. I don't know how to explain that, but yeah, of just like constantly filtering like everything I'm doing as like, is this a good thing? Uh, Cause if it's not like, I don't want that and I don't want to be that. So um, there's that, there's definitely, I mean, like the whole academic mindset, I would say even was influenced by church. Um, I know it's like a huge, just like Western culture thing in general, but <clears throat> like the way my mind thinks intellectually, like trying to rationalize my way through things, um, I think also, because that is something like, at least for me, that evangelical Christianity did focus on because they were so sure, like of their correctness, that they would like tell you like, you know, like, go do the research, like, book knowledge isn't gonna, <laughs> um like book knowledge won't conflict with what we're teaching you like they prided themselves on like that the proof would always point to the truth which is what we're preaching um yeah and then I do like believe that a lot of like the values I hold like we're positively influenced um, by religion as well. I mean, just like empathy towards others, like that's a good thing. Um, like being a steward of our resources is like something that's super important to me and is like based in my faith. Um, yeah, just like acting out of love and like, I don't know, you know, like the fruits of the spirit. I could not quote all of them to you now, but um, humility, goodness, faithfulness, joy, peace, patience, which I don't have much of, to be honest, but I try. Um, yeah, so, and I know like, well, yeah, that's what I'll say on that for now. Hmm. Use this phrase making the faith your own, how would you say that you made the faith your own? Uh, yeah. Um, this like feels like heretical of me now to like champion this phrase um, mm. in a different way than I was intended. <laughs> mm. um, what do you mean by that? <laughs> um, like in the context of evangelical Christianity I think like making your faith your own was like really stepping up and like taking responsibility for like your actions and what you believe as long as it conforms to uh -huh. <laughs> what you're being uh -huh. taught uh -huh. um and now you know like yeah I definitely made my faith my own by like to like it just totally like changed into something new that mm. Uh, definitely I would say has aspects of like evangelical Christianity but like is not it's funny because I, I still tell my like I still tell people and myself that I'm Christian mm -hmm. um like if I went into the like details of like and like truly honest um of like what that meant like a, an evangelical Christian from my church or, like family would be like no you're not like that's not what that means mm -hmm. um yeah. And just to be clear, so, like 
what I want to get at is how do you see things now on your own terms, or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, yeah, the answer to that is I don't really know. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I'm gonna be able to give a good answer. Um That's I've a good kind answer. of embraced like <laughs> um yeah, I've kind of like just tried to embrace the whole like uh cloud of uncertainty that is like religion and spirituality to me um like if you ask me right now like do I still believe if like Jesus was even like a real person who came and like died on the cross I would tell you I don't know I don't know if that's important um I don't know if like believing in a literal heaven and hell is important like I don't think it changes how I act now um, and I don't think it should, like, I don't, that's the, the other thing about childhood is, like, hell as a concept is, like, this thing that they hold over you as, like, scary, so, like, of course you're gonna want to go and, like, do whatever it takes or say whatever you have to say to, like, not end up there, but I don't want to, like, be living my life or believing something because of a fear, um, so, and I, like get into arguments with my parents about this all the time but like the way that Christians sometimes use like heaven is my home as an excuse to like not address problems that are happening here in the like present day world um irks me to to the extreme <laughs> um it's just like this kind of like fallback cushion of of comfort that like was really nice when I had it and like now it's gone and it's uncomfortable and it's like a little scarier, but like allows me to live in a much more like real and genuine way. Hmm. Um, and like really kind of like diving into just like embodying love, I think is like my main, like what I'm taking with me from religion. Um, is just like loving everybody to the best of my ability because uh, that's like really all I can do so hmm. well this is just my opinion but uh, for what it's worth that seems very Christian to me <laughs> thank you um Yeah, the question I want to ask now is about, this is not really a hypothetical question, but a question that's meant to get at something, because it's a real question, but it's meant to get at something. So I'll ask it in two ways. Some, something I'm trying to practice is explaining what my questions mean when it might not be obvious what they mean. <laughs> so that's, I'm practicing that right now. Um, the question, as it occurs to me, is if you were to imagine you on your deathbed, looking back at you now, what's the kind of life that you'd want to live that you imagine you would be proud of as you die? And uh, the sort of simpler version of that question is like, what values do you want to live by? Yeah, I actually think about this a lot. Um, yeah, I always, I'm going to answer your question maybe in a roundabout way. Sure. Um, by talking about something else first and then getting back to it. But um, I would say, like, generally, I'm pretty stressed out, <laughs> which, like, I won't place a value judgment on that, I guess. But if I like dig into like why I'm stressed, it's like this sense of urgency of like needing to do things that are worthwhile. Um, so like being in a limbo kind of like I had then since getting back from trail uh, for the past, you know, year and a half now almost. Uh, like drives me crazy um and like I know things take time and unfold in their own time um 
And like from the outside, someone would like probably not think like, oh, she's just like sitting around doing nothing. Because like, you know, I am working, I am in school, like, I'm working towards something, but like it never feels like it's happened fast enough for me. Um, and I think a, a part of that is like this, like, not in, a, in like a dark way, but like this sense of like impending death at some point, like, just like being aware, like, I'm gonna die. I don't know when, but like, I want to do something before I do. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out, I think. Um, and I feel like I'm getting closer to it. And I feel like I'm getting better at making decisions that embody the values I want to be living out. Um, and like, I believe there are little ways to do that, like on a daily basis, just in interacting with people um, that like adds value to their lives. Um, But at the same time, like, I, I want to aspire to something big and grand. Um, and sometimes that feels naive of me. And, like, people are like, oh, like, I, like, I don't know if it's, like, an ambition thing or, like, a pride thing. Um, but people are always like, oh, like, you're young. Like, that'll fade with time. And it's like, I don't want it to fade. I don't want to just, like, be, um, you know, like, this, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it's good. I think it's what I'm saying to like have an ambition to do something great. But what that is specifically, couldn't tell you. Um, yeah, I wish like, hmm. I wish like people loved. This, this also seems like feels heretical of me right now, but like I sometimes wish that like, people loved our home as much as they loved each other. Um, and like some people don't even do a great job of like loving each other and I don't sometimes either, but um, yeah, I don't know what to, what more to say about that. And by our home, do you mean, uh people's houses or uh communities or the earth or something else yeah like the earth That's, i thought you meant um, that. i just wanted to check yeah <clears throat> yeah i mean like i guess like people view it like as inanimate but it is like very much also a living thing um and like to me like it's like a living being so it's like weird to me that it comes second to other living beings mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Uh, see how to ask this. I'm hearing that it's important to you to do something big and something ambitious, and you don't want to lose that. And you don't know what it is, and that makes total sense. Um, what are what are the qualities of the thing that you hope to do that you would be satisfied by? You're like, yes, this is good. This is ambitious. This is big. Mm -hmm. Like not not needing to know the particulars, but like, um, is it something for the planet? Is it something for your local community? Is it something that, um, I don't know demonstrates a certain quality that you have in your character or like is it about yeah what's it about like even if you don't need it I, I don't expect you to know the specifics but like what do you value what do you care about with that why do you care about it yeah without thinking about it too much I'd say like my initial reaction is like something with like building a community um is like so satisfying like that mm. sounds great <laughs> um and, like, not just, like, finding one, but, like, building one. Um, and, like, I think like after that, I guess, like, for me, just because that, that also feels like first step. Because like once you have that, it feels like, you know, the activation energy to the next thing is just, like, so much lower with that momentum and that force, like, going forward. Um, it feels like it would open 
like a whole lot of other opportunities. But yeah, like sustainable is a huge word that jumps out to me. Um, like symbiotic relationships. Um, yeah, something that's like thriving and living and growing and like not taking or diminishing um, or dying. <laughs> Um, those are kind of the words that are jumping out to me. I'm not sure if that is forming a picture or not, but. It's an excellent response. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm asking lots of difficult yeah. questions and you're just hitting them out of the park one after another. So thank you. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to turn to your experience on the trail and talk about that for a while. Um, this is really, I think, just to set some context, one of the things that drew me to you and felt, I've, I've for a long time felt a kinship with you about because, um, well, walking has always been a big part of my life. And um, in particular, I've done two walking pilgrimages. And to me, it seems like there are things that you know from your experience that I can tell that you know, that like, you wouldn't know unless you'd been through that kind of an experience. And um, I get this sometimes when I talk to people who've been on a trail or something like that. Um, but it's, it's a little bit rare in our culture. And it's always been nice to talk to you about this over the couple of years that we've known each other now. And um, yeah, so I'm curious to hear more about that and just sort of setting the context of why I'm curious. And um, yeah, I think th this is, this is, um, an oddly specific question to start with, but I'm curious what, if you could describe the rate at which you walked through the the season and like what was sort of your fastest rate and your slowest rate and what was that like for you? Uh, yeah, I wish I could answer this better. Um, honestly, I did not pay attention. I can, I can tell you that when I was angry or emotional about external actors, my room skyrocketed mm. um, and was much faster and propelled me um, than when it was just like a normal day. Um, yeah, like if I knew I was getting somewhere exciting, also my rate would definitely increase if I was hiking in town. If I was hiking in bad weather and like was hiking to a shelter or somewhere warm. Um, but it really, it changed a lot. It varied a lot. It depended on how much my bag weighed. Um, so if I had just filled up with food at a town and was hiking out, then it was probably a lot slower. <laughs> um, certain terrains were just really hard in Pennsylvania and north of there, it gets really rocky. Um, and like the footwork is just a lot more, you have to pay attention. Um, the White Mountains, I swear to God, almost killed me. Um, they're just a lot of up and down and a lot of like rock climbing and sliding down rocks and throwing your bags over rocks because you can't fit in the rock with your backpack on. And um, But I mean, if I had to like generalize the whole trail, um, it took us almost six months. So we started April 1st and we ended September 25th. Um, and we took 10 days off in Pennsylvania and I took another four days off for a wedding that I flew home to. So minus two weeks, I guess. Uh, plus you have zero days, but people generally include those when they do their overall mileage. But um, I can't calculate that in my head. <laughs> Uh, but that will tell you how many miles I walked a day, mm -hmm. um, which I, I think I did it once. It might be around somewhere between like 10 and 14 um, miles. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so my, my friend and I too, like when you ask about like rate or pace, um, we definitely were pretty like big on breaks uh compared to like some people like we took like short breaks pretty often 
Um, and we also were usually the last people out of camp because of me, because I like to sleep and the sun does not wake me up. And then we were like the last people to camp. So we would kind of hike later in the day compared to a lot of people. But uh, hmm. yeah. Hmm. If you were to do another trail, like the other trail that you mentioned that you want to do, what would you do to prepare for that? Um, probably the same thing I did here, which is like absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like you can physically prepare to an extent. It's hard where I live because there's no hills. Um, so it more becomes just like this endurance thing. Uh, so like you can run and do stairs and like put a backpack on and just go hike. Um, but like, I believe that anyone can do it physically. Like it's not, it's not a physical endeavor. It's more of a mental endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't really prepare for that. You either just like do it or you don't. And on that side of things, what was it like for you qualitatively when you were walking? What was your sort of inner experience like? Yeah, a lot of boredom. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of like regret is the wrong word, but like I was, I was sad that I had to like watch my feet so often <laughs> um, because I couldn't like be up and like looking around as often as I wanted to be because I was just focused on like not tripping and dying. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the first week, uh, my friend and I decided to like do no music uh, and that was just like a lot again it reminded me of like that headspace I was in in the DR where you're just in your head a lot and you're just able to think um, a lot um, and I had like a lot of like personal drama going on at the beginning of the AT and like <laughs> My, my friend called me out on this, but she was like, you literally just like make up scenarios in your head and like get angry at these fake scenarios that you yourself are creating. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I do, I do, do that. Uh -huh. And like, I like, like have like fake conversations with people. Um, often like they're like in my head, it's like a conflict that's happening. And so I kind of like got to like think about that a little bit. And I was like, I like to feel prepared, I think is what it comes down to of like all these possible scenarios and like how best I can, you know, prepare myself for a situation like that. But um, so, yeah, and then we reintroduced music and it was like mind blowing. Um, just because like you're so surrounded by like noise and like the, there's radios and working as a barista, the radio is always on. And I didn't realize that, but like I'm constantly inundated with like noise. Um, and actually since then, this is the first time I'm making this connection. But since trail, I get really like noise sensitive. Um, like just like strange noises really irritate me. Loud noises really irritate me. Just having too much of a noise, I like have to like make it stop. <laughs> um, mm. Because like, it's just, you're just outside and there's not much going on. Um, we would like have conversations sometimes, but yeah, you, you also just kind of, I think I, I did at least like you, you go into this autopilot zone where you're like, not really actively like thinking about much. You're just, you know, just like one foot in front of the other. Like it becomes a very like embodied, just like movement um more than like like for me like I like I hear like a voice when I think you know type of thing like another person talking almost um and it just kind of like shuts off and goes to sleep and like my body just takes over and goes hmm. Hmm. why did you all decide to reintroduce music why um, so we, we, to, we decided it at the beginning when we decided that we would get rid of it. Um, so it was like this, I mean, cause the boredom just crept in. Um, so it was, it was also something to look forward to. It was like a goal that we could reach. 
you know, like after hiking a week, like we'll get the prize of music. Mm -hmm. um, and like, that was really exciting actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When you were bored, how did you know that you were bored? What was that like? It's a great question. It was kind of just like, irritation isn't the right word. Um, <clears throat> kind of just like, you know that feeling when you're just like sick of everything that you could possibly do? Not sure if there's a word for that, but like, you know, like you could start a conversation with who you're hiking with. You could listen to music. You could listen to an audiobook. You could listen to a podcast. You could just walk. But after a while, it's just like, I don't want to do any of that. And that's boredom. Hmm. Why did you not want to do any of that? Uh, because I have been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. There was nothing interesting within those things. Mm -hmm. They had nothing to offer me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about yourself through walking? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm strong. <laughs> that was a thing. <laughs> like both physically and mentally, like really tough. Um, I have like a hard time saying nice things about myself. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is your um, chance. Here we go. <laughs> I'm I'm specifically asking for it. I so. know. Even when people do that, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm like, I'm starting to admit that at least more to myself recently, mm. like, um, yeah, I can, I can do stuff, you know, like I, I can, I can do things like I have the power to act. Uh, that's really cool. Um, and also like, I am a social creature. This sounds weird to be a thing that like you realize about yourself, but um, I really, really value like my independence and alone time and also, I like, I like people. <laughs> I like people. It's okay to like people. I like made it. I was one of those people in high school who like made it my personality to not like people. Um, and I, I really wish I hadn't done that, but I did. So um, it's okay to like people. And it is even fun to like people sometimes. What was that about when you made it your personality to not like people? I don't, I don't um, understand. Yeah, I think I was, so this was also in the whole knee era. Um, I think I was emotionally numb was a big part or like repressed, maybe not numb. Um, I didn't know how to express emotion or interact with emotion. And when other people had emotions, it like made me mad I that they were having emotions. Um, because it it seemed like dramatic and unnecessary to me hmm. uh, because I'm bottling up my emotions so why can't you do the same thing um and now like I love to be the dramatic person with my emotions so that's a funny 180 but <clears throat> yeah I think it was mostly just on my own like anger and not knowing how to deal with my feelings at the time mm -hmm. That makes sense. Hmm. I want to ask you about, um, uh, I found some tweets of yours about the trail. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm scared. Okay. Well, I'll ask you about them and you can say what you like. Uh, you said, one of my favorite trail memories is laying on the rocks of a waterfall, watching the microscopic life in a stagnant puddle. Can you tell me about that? If if it if it feels like you'd like to share it, which you may not, I would totally understand if you're like, that's a private experience. No, for sure. Um, yeah, that makes me so happy just thinking about that moment. Um, my friend and I were taking one of our many breaks for lunch 
and we just <laughs> we really didn't want to move <laughs> like we usually tried to like time ourselves um <clears throat> but this time we were just procrastinating really is what it came down to and yeah so it was this waterfall there were these rocks we found a big one to lay on and obviously the water levels are changing and there were just these like puddles of water within the divots of the rock um and the sun was out and the rocks were super warm and so like I was just like laying down on my stomach like basking in the warmth um and like looking into this puddle because I didn't want to move and there were just like all these like small little bugs and like things moving that you couldn't even like make out what it looked like because it was so small like you could tell it was moving um and it, it was just yeah it was mind-boggling like my friend and I would just like look at it and be like they're like probably living their whole life in this span of like us on our lunch break hiking the Appalachian Trail for however many months of our life. Hmm. And it's like in this single moment is like their life. Um, it was just cool. Yeah. And it was like colorful. It was this pretty like green color, which I love. Um, yeah, it was just a good moment. How did that make you feel to sort of see them and think about time uh really lucky to like be a creature that has more of it hmm. um and kind of like again that like sense of urgency and also like responsibility like I have a responsibility to like do something with that and like yeah hmm. like pay it pay it forward or hmm. pay it back it's beautiful. I'm just gonna sit with that for a minute. It's kind of a rainy, gray day here, and uh, there's clouds and the sun coming through. But it sort of—I didn't have this experience, but you sort of transported me to it so it's it's sweet yes um here's another one they're all nice at least in my opinion they're all nice i don't know a uh, girl who says she could never get post-trail depression and then sobs in her bed for 30 minutes straight looking at photos from the trail with the relieved emoji three times uh very interesting uh first off any comment about this before i ask specific questions but <laughs> I don't remember this, so, mm -hmm. but it, it sounds very like me. <laughs> uh -huh. hmm. What, what yeah. <laughs> did you hear people saying about post-trail depression? Um, that everyone, that you will get it. <laughs> hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. Um, just that it's a really weird transition back into everyday normal life um and also just physically of not being as physically active is a hard like thing for your body to adjust to um yeah and I think <laughs> that uh I'm again I, I don't know if I really thought it seems dumb now to think that it wouldn't happen to me but um, I think because I was like, oh, like they talked about this um, at, in the Peace Corps too. They talked about like reverse culture shock um, of like coming home after Peace Corps. And I was like, well, that didn't really happen. But I think it was just because like I had so many other things to like be shocked by with like COVID happening um that it, it just like manifested itself differently but I think part of me was like well I didn't really get a culture shock so like I probably won't get post-trail depression either mm -hmm. um but I think I I did get both of those things it just wasn't like you never know what it's gonna look like for you um mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I'm remembering that there was this theme in your story of your life about you know, having a really intense experience and then just moving on to the next thing, like no transition, <laughs> and no uh, time to sort of process or um, <clears throat> grieve even um, or adapt in a certain way. It was just, it's just like, oh, now we're doing this. 
seemed like that happened multiple times. And um, the question I want to ask is, uh, yeah, again, this is sort of a, a two-part question or a two-layer question. You can look at it either way, whichever way is easier. But the, the way it occurs to me is, say something dramatic happens in your future, you know, um, some kind of loss or, you know, some big transition or a job changes or, you know, something like that, right? A breakup, whatever. What would you wish for yourself in the future to be able to integrate that kind of experience without transitioning to something else? What would you wish for yourself? And the sort of practical version of that question is knowing what you've gone through so far, how would you suggest someone process a, a sudden transition? Uh, um, it's like I can see the little ways that I'm still doing this um, in like less dramatic scenarios. So I'm, I'm not the expert by any means. Oh, that's why I asked like, you. I'm, uh, because I'm still like I haven't found the answer clearly mm. um and I'll say that like something I struggle with like directly related to this is again that sense of urgency that I've like always felt like I would it upsets me to feel like I'm wasting like my time um this <laughs> sounds bad when I say it out loud uh, but like those like mo like rest in general <laughs> is so hard for me because mm. I'm like selling it to myself as a waste of time. And I, I know like my head knows uh, that that's not true, um, but <laughs> it's really hard. Mm. Yeah, it's really hard for me to do things that like people say or like even if I've seen other people do these things that are like good for them. It's, it's hard for me to like slow down and rest or process or uh, do any of those things. So yeah, I throw myself into activity um, in some way that I like find it or justify it. <laughs> so with all of that being said, Um, maybe just like getting accountability when it's like a big scenario like the DR or like the trail and you know like it's happening type of thing like as opposed to some like emotional upset like a loss or a breakup or uh, something unforeseen maybe to like enlist my friends and family to kind of like force me uh, or like, at least, I mean, they can't force me, but to keep me accountable and saying like, hey, you wanted to rest or like have this period of not doing anything like job or school or whatever um, after this concludes. So like, we're going to check in on you and like, make sure that you're not doing those things because um, like peer pressure is a good tool. And, <laughs> a positive peer pressure in that sense um yeah I'm not sure like what else might work hmm. but that would be a good, a good start hmm. how does it feel to talk about this right now um uh, uh, it's Um, that's a good question. <laughs> You're making me do it. <laughs> um, maybe slightly embarrassing. Hmm. Well, let me ask yeah. you a different question then. Uh, <laughs> which might be embarrassing from a different angle but i'm wondering what the phrase that's a good question you said earlier that's a great question in this conversation and just now that's a good question what does that mean to you what are you saying when you say that um <clears throat> i almost just said it again well what do you mean now then 
<laughs> um, like, like my brain gears are turning. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm diving like deeper into my brain to give you an answer. Mm -hmm. Um, and like taking more paths to get there. What does that mean? Um, that there's nuance or that it's complicated, that like there are multiple facets to the answer. How does it feel to be asked a good question? <laughs> it feels good. It's exciting. It's like a, it's like an adventure boy. <laughs> um like an inner adventure. <laughs> it, I I have done this for a while now where um when I'm talking about like my mental model, it's like often a forest of like trails. Um, I might have even had some tweets about that, but in some way it's like when I think it's like I'm traveling within myself. So it's, yeah, it's fun. It's an exploration mm -hmm. um, and it can be challenging in like a good way and yeah, in a growing way, so. Mm. What is that metaphor of your inner experience being like a forest of trails imply for you? What does that mean? What does that say? What is it like for you internally? Um, <laughs> uh, dense. It's uh, <laughs> there's just it's a lot going on. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of twists and turns. It's it changes unexpectedly. Um, it's foreign to me in a way, but like also familiar. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad I asked because uh, <laughs> that wasn't what I expected you to say. So I like it. Yeah. Mm. Um, let's see. Can I ask what you expected? Hmm. Well, it's interesting because I, I have a. Um, hmm. I think about this in general and also in particular, and the particular might be easier to talk about, but like when I have these conversations, um, either podcast conversations or increasingly there's other kinds of more private conversations that I have that are like this, there's a specific visual image that recurs to me to describe my experience of it that I should probably try drawing sometime now that I can draw a little bit, but- um, yes. I want to see it. Yeah. Oof. Uh, okay. I'll make a note of this. Um, but it's it's basically branching, and you know, like it's, I see a line, and then like little, like offshoots, and um, within yeah, it's like nesting. So there can be lots of offshoots within, and then like once you get to the end of a trail, it's like okay, next trail. You could like go back up and go to the next one, and sort of a tree structure and. Um, um, I think that that's also kind of my general experience of thinking is that things are connected and the more connections you can have between them, the more interesting thoughts you have. And, um, like every time you add a new trail, it's like everything has changed because of that. And, um, what I really liked about the way you described it was how it's both foreign and familiar. I really liked that a lot. It was sort of a qualitative answer. Uh, you know, the, the way I'm feeling into it is very like geometrical almost or like shaped or like, and and I liked, I liked the, um, the, the way you characterized it is like, oh yeah, it is like that. Um, it's like, oh, I, I, this is familiar in a way, but also foreign in a way. I mean, th this is, you know, it's interesting because when I ask a question, like any of the questions I think I've asked you, like you are the expert on you. So you have actually have the authoritative answer and you can decide to answer however you want. And it's like, it's not like a test in school where, you know, there's a right answer that someone else has that you have to sort of replicate in, in yourself. You are the source of whatever answer you end up giving. You can't be wrong. Even if you like lied to me or something, right? That would still be the right answer in a way, right? Even if it was 
factually inaccurate or something because you're giving it. And um, so you are familiar to yourself and often because of the nature of a question, um, you are seeing yourself from a different angle and um, you're looking at something familiar from a new light or a new angle or a new perspective. And I really liked that you surfaced that. Yeah, um, I can also generally relate, sorry, to no, seeing please. that <laughs> that forest model, the shapes of like interconnecting trails and like circling your way back. Um, it's definitely very true of how I think about it sometimes as well. Hmm. Well, let's see, there's, there's two other things I want to ask you about, and maybe others will come up because they always come up when we talk, but... Uh, one is about your studies right now and you know that you just accepted this job that'll start in April and um it's the question well let's start with your studies what 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 are you studying and what's that like for you Yeah, um, it's it's a very broad field. Um, yeah, so my master's in natural resources, to repeat myself, but what that means, like, specifically. Um, a lot of it was a lot of the general courses that, like, you're required to take was like on research um how to do like natural and social science research um a lot of it is more like <laughs> um leadership and communication um another one is like action and investigation. Like they're very broad, these like conceptual things almost. Um, and then like you're required to like pick a topic to explore and like apply these concepts to. Uh, so a lot of my focus, I don't have to write a thesis or dissertation actually with the online course that I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> But I have been focusing a lot on like agriculture techniques and composting. Um, I like to learn about dirt quite a lot. <laughs> um, but also I've had classes like about wildlife conservation and biology, forest health management. Um, yeah, just like ecology in general, best management practices. Um, I had to learn a lot about like our like EPA, uh, federal acts, clean water, clean air act. Um, yeah. So it's kind of a little bit of everything that you could like possibly think of when it comes to natural resources management. Um, hmm. yeah. Are you enjoying it? I love it. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which is, really exciting for me because when I like went to my undergrad and was studying chemistry I like despised it and mm -hmm. that was really hard for me as like someone who had loved school all of these years growing up and like definitely placed a lot of my identity in how I performed academically which is not so much the case now but like to be able to authentically enjoy like what I'm learning about and like want to apply myself because like I know that it's just gonna like reap a greater benefit for me going forward is like really really fun and exciting so yeah I do enjoy it a lot hmm. and when you have your job what will that entail yeah, so I'm going to be a forestry technician. Um, so even though I've, like, focused a lot on compost and agriculture, I'd say, like, another really big interest of mine would be, like, forestry and just, like, trees, plants, and mushrooms. Um, so I don't, like, know a ton of details yet. They are working on, like, a few different projects, um, some of which are looking at, like, 
climate change adaptation techniques. Uh, so as like, you know, conditions change for certain species, they tend to like migrate to different areas. Um, so looking at that, looking at deer browsing effects on forest regeneration, um, that's a big thing here in Wisconsin is we have a lot of deer and they eat a lot of plants. <laughs> um, some other ones are actually mycorrhizal associations uh, in the forest and how they impact small mammal communities, which I don't know what that means or which small mammal communities we might be looking at, but that gets me super pumped and excited. Mm. Um, yeah, and I'm sure a lot of that will like look at soil health too, which is exciting, but yeah, they just like have a lot of different stuff going on. I know a lot of it will be technical um, identifying trees, what species they are, collecting seeds. Um, maybe it says maybe trapping small mammals. So again, I'm really excited. I hope I get to like catch a raccoon or a skunk or something and like <laughs> show you guys on Twitter <laughs> all about it. But most likely it's probably going to be chipmunks and squirrels. So I'll try to keep my hopes down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Am I and I'm am I remembering correctly that you said it was some kind of like seasonal job, like a short term job? Yeah, it's a limited term employment position, so it's like based on hours you work. But from my understanding, it'll go through October if I, I remember correctly. April to October. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I want to flag. I'm learning a lot about conversation from this conversation, uh, and I want to flag that I'm about to ask the question I really wanted to ask. And I had to ask, I think, three or four questions in order to ask this question. So, uh, which is often the case, but there was a long pause earlier and I was like, ah, oh, I can't ask the question right away. I have to ask three or four preparatory questions to get to this one. So, um, and of course the, the life story and everything we've talked about is um, all preparation as well, but this is one I feel excited to ask and how to put it into words. This is similar. The, the other thing to know is this is a similar question to the question I asked about your deathbed earlier. Like, what would you be proud of your life if you'd lived it? And so this is sort of um, a different version of the same question with respect to your career, which is, I don't know, say, say you're retiring, okay? Say you're like 65 or whatever, and you're retiring. Uh, and, you know, you didn't end up doing this particular job or, you know, you did it from April to October and like something else happened after that, right? Um, what would you be, what do you imagine that at that point where you retired, you would be proud of the work that you've done with your life? Um, again, you don't need to know the specifics of what you'll end up doing, but what is it that you feel called to? What is it that you're drawn to? What would you feel proud of in retrospect at that point in the future? Yeah, uh, I think like seeing a community around me that cares about uh, similar things. Um, and that would look like the nature that surrounds them, incorporating nature into the cityscape. Um, I think having a community that is like, um, Ooh, there's a word, a technical word for this, uh, like food secure. Um, I think that would be really cool. Like, you know, being able to rely on yourself uh, for your food needs. Um, yeah, that would be really cool. There are like definitely some like specific things that come to mind when I say stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I've like talked a little bit about like wanting to incorporate more of like, uh, like more things like community community gardens and stuff into urban settings, um, and making that a bigger space and focus in a community. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I guess like just like people like realizing that 
you know, taking care of like nature and our forests and rivers and whatever else we have is like an investment for like our futures as well. Um, yeah, that would be really cool. I'm hearing from what you're saying that it's important to you to live a life that's in harmony with your community and the world and nature where each of those things are connected and even like benefiting each other, but certainly not harming each other. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I think too, like, yeah, there's some sort of like educational outreach component to that, I think as well in hmm. my head. Um, just like, I, I do think that like some people maybe don't even realize like the disconnect there is between their lives and nature. Um, especially if you like grow up in a very urban setting. Um, and I think that's really, that's like such a huge loss. Um, and yeah, just to like be able to introduce opportunities for like people everywhere to reconnect with that and like kind of rekindle that part of themselves. I think it just like adds like so much value uh, mm -hmm. to a life uh, to be able to have that, so. I'm very sympathetic to that and I want you to do that and I would like to ask about it, which is what does it mean to be disconnected from nature? Because I mean, obviously you, you kind of can't be disconnected from nature, but, but you are actually referring to something at the same time. So what is it that you're referring to specifically? What, what do you see through your eyes about our society that's not working? Nature is like seen as other um, and it's, <laughs> I wanna say it's not, but that doesn't give like mm. much of a mm -hmm. explanation of what it is. Um, like nature is like life sustaining. So, I think it can be easy to like kind of be blinded to that um even when you're in nature like just like not being able to see that or recognize it for what it is um Yeah, I'm not sure I know how to answer more of mm. that, how to give more words. <laughs> what do you feel as you try to answer that? Hmm. Like a little bit of grief. Um, I don't know, it makes me think of, I read Braiding Sweetgrass like over the last few years. Um, and it's a very, it's so beautiful. I love that book. I recommend it to everyone. Um, but like it took me through like a grieving process for like myself and like humanity in our world for like this thing that we've lost in our relationship and connection to nature. Um, and this thing that was like, so like automatic and inherent is like being weakened um just like by a society and priorities in general I think um and like it's a really beautiful relationship that is like accessible to everyone um but like people like almost don't like they don't even know that it exists or that it's there for like them to appreciate or like take advantage of and not take advantage of in like a derogatory or like diminishing mm -hmm. way but like to 
yeah to take part in mm -hmm. I guess and how do you feel now <sighs> um really appreciative and grateful <laughs> that like I've gone through this whole process and like do have that relationship and like get to experience that on an almost daily basis. What's that like for you when you do experience it? It's like this overwhelming sense of like peace and belonging. <laughs> hmm. um, and like this awe of like the beauty that surrounds me everywhere I go. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. When I'm like, go on a hike outside, it literally like that solves all my problems while I'm on that hike. Mm. Um, yeah. There's something I've come to notice over time about people uh, uh, that's coming up now is like, you, as you described that, you look like you're in love. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very sweet. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, there's one more branch I'd like to ask about, which is, uh, could just be as simple as one question, but again, it might branch out. Um, this is a question. Well, it's a, it's a two-part question, two-part question that's different than a two-layer question. <laughs> uh, as you can tell. I'm learning a lot about questions and curiosity and conversation. So thanks for humoring me. Um, the, 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 first, the first question is a, is a simpler um, question. It's asked as a superlative, but you can answer this however you want, which is what activity do you feel most yourself doing? Uh, it could be multiple activities. It could be like just up there. Any, anything is fine. But like what's something that you do that makes you feel like yourself? Uh, yeah, so there are a few. Um, a top one is definitely swimming. Mm. Um, it like feels like breathing almost at this point. Um, yeah. Also, like where I find like calm and peace is like being in the water. Um, and it's just like very comforting. Um, yeah, so swimming, I think as of late, uh, painting. Um, and obviously, I, as I just uh, said, any ex, um, like activity outdoors, really hiking, uh, usually alone, or like with my dog, um, but like being somewhere where I'm just like totally surrounded by, you know, earth. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. You answered this with respect to swimming and then also earlier with respect to being in nature, but what's it like for you qualitatively when you paint? What's your experience of painting like? Yeah, it's also calming. <laughs> I'm seeing a trend here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just like kind of this like emptying process of like there's this like idea or feeling or vision or something in my brain and it's just like pouring out of me onto the paper in front of me. Um, and sometimes like my brain fights back because I'm such a perfectionist and like I don't let myself like <laughs> stop uh, because I want it to be perfect, but... <laughs> I'm not uh, working on that. <laughs> um, but yeah. Mm. And it's fun. It's fun to paint. It's like also exciting and you like don't know necessarily, at least I don't, because I'm not like very good at it in a technical sense, but mm. like, you don't know like what's going to happen or where it's going to go. You just kind of have to like do it and find out. Mm. ask this question
Yeah, well, if you, well, it's a few versions, but if you think of one of the paintings that you've done, what's something that surprised you about it? You, know, when you said, oh, you don't know where it's going to go. And then when you finished it, what was something you're like, oh, wow, it went in that direction. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so I'll often like try to paint something specific that I have in mind. Um, and like I said, I don't know much about like technical like skills or strategy or technique. Just for the viewer, to... they're very good. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I like them. <laughs> um, but, but like, so this one time, it was one of my earlier paintings. I was like, I had this like image of like water lilies um, that I wanted to paint. <laughs> and I tried to paint this and utterly and completely failed. Um, but I had this like really nice blue background. Um, and kind of like some white splotches here and there and I like turned it into this jellyfish um I'm not even sure like where the jellyfish idea came from but it ended up being like one of my favorite paintings for mm. a really long time mm. um and like still kind of within the same like theme of where my mind was going um but just like not what I had expected to sit down and actually paint mm. Hmm. What pleased you about it when it was, yeah, what pleased you about it? Um, it was, <laughs> it was so, like, textured and, like, also creative in a way. Um, it was, like, not realistic, but it looked very, like, I don't know, it was just, like, pleasing to look at. Hmm. Um, and the color contrast, it was like this really deep, vivid blue, and then just the white jellyfish. Mm. Mm. What would say what you say in general pleases you about pieces that you do when you think of all of the pieces that you've done that you really like? What's what's a trend or commonality between them? A uh, good color blending really makes me happy. <laughs> mm. Um like gradients of color like I love doing like sunrises or sunsets or like skies colorful skies um in the background a lot of them are nature related which makes me happy mm -hmm. um me too I love when I can successfully do a tree there's something just really satisfying about having like a good solid tree that looks real I could and, not like, agree more pretty... <laughs> yeah um I don't get them like perfect in my head very often, but when I do, mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. I'm having the desire come up for, you know, I asked you this question earlier about um, transitions between things and what you would do, what you would want for yourself. I'm wanting you to paint if that happens again. Yeah, yeah I think that would actually be really good for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you're on to something. Yeah. Mm. What would you say to someone who maybe didn't see the value of art? Who was like, why would you do that? What would you say to them? Oh, that was like literally me. Mm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> honestly, I'd probably say, okay, you will someday. <laughs> mm. um, I don't know how to explain it. It like just seems like this thing that like comes for everyone this appreciation of like beauty and expression um and like I guess in a more like snarky sense I would probably point out that like everything is art in a way so like you you do appreciate art you just like maybe don't think of it as art hmm. What makes you say it comes for everyone, this desire to connect to beauty or expression? I, it just feels like, like it's part of human nature. <laughs> hmm. um, you know, like everyone wants to connect with emotion and like humanity and meaning and purpose and um I think art does a good job at like embodying all of those things hmm. well you've been very patient 
uh, despite you saying you don't have much patience in uh, <laughs> answering my many uh, questions. They're somewhat prying in nature, but also <laughs> hopefully more enjoyable to answer than not. Um, Definitely. Is there anything that you would like to talk about or anything further that you'd like to share? Oh, man. I mean, I could literally go on for like ever, it seems like about any of these topics, mm -hmm. but, but I don't know. I think, think I want to leave it as is because I trust, I trust the process and the conversation to have done its work and to have elicited out of me the things that are like important. So mm. beautiful, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> mm. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. And uh, for me, um, just having a conversation like this is is precious and sacred to me, genuinely. And, uh, you know, irrespective of whether we recorded it or not, or shared it with people or not, but um, just to really connect to someone and see who they are and understand them and make the world a little bigger because I heard from someone else is precious and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to share yourself in that way. And uh, it's, I think, really beautiful that we get to share this with the world as well and uh, let the world see who you are and see through your eyes for a little bit and feel through your heart and walk with your feet as well. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much for like doing these and for pestering me about this <laughs> for like the last three months um because I'm the worst at following up but I will do things eventually if you keep reminding me so yeah my pleasure my pleasure I'm glad we got to do it me too